Hey, what's going on everybody on YouTube? Steve here with Rakin Profit. Welcome to another Green Room show. In today's show, we're going to be discussing how to open a brick and mortar bookstore with Jesse Forbes. So what's going on everybody? I'm Steve Rakin, 29 years old, been reselling for four or five years now, eBay, Amazon, Craigslist, doing Shopify now, which it's funny because about probably two years ago, Two years ago or more, Jesse and I were having a conversation, and you were in it way before I even knew what it was. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. Chris, why don't you introduce yourself, and then we'll pass it over to Jesse. What's up, guys? Chris, also known as the Bonafide Hustler on YouTube. I buy and resell stuff I find from garage sales, estate sales, flea markets, pawn shops, swap meets. And I put it on places like eBay, Amazon, Craigslist, uh, antique booth, and consignment stores in town. Do it pretty much part-time right now because the other half of my life can – is with the green room, right? It's with the green room and starting a private label brand. Anyway, that's what I do. And let's get right to our guest, Jesse Forbes. Where are you talking to us from, man? You look What's like you're in a bookstore. Like, what are the chances you'd be in a bookstore on a yeah, bookstore? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I, we're, we're actually in my bookstore right now. Um, uh, we're in Delaware. I started reselling a long time ago, back when Steve was doing videos on about flipping bikes on Craigslist. That's when I started reselling stuff on eBay. And we, I slowly but surely got into books, and, and now we do about – we'll do one to two semi-loads per month. Um, I, I sell online, and, and just recently we opened up this bookstore, so we're doing brick and mortar too. Awesome. Well, that's good. Delaware, right? Is that what you said? Yep, Delaware? I'm in Delaware. Okay. So Delaware, um, that's a really small state, isn't it, Steve? It's, it's itty-bitty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I passed through it a few times. And actually, okay. I went through it for the first time, I think, last year and did pretty well at the thrift stores at the Goodwills, I remember. So when you like exited the thrift store parking lot, were you ready in like a different state? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, right? Um, but anyway, today, uh, yeah. So uh, all jokes aside, today we're going to be talking about um, basically how to open up a brick and mortar store. We're gonna, it's going to be interesting to follow Jesse Forbes' story as he progresses. And you also have a Facebook group as well, and people can follow your journey through there. Is this right? Facebook? Uh, most of the groups that I hang out in right now are, are book selling groups. I'm a big okay, fan so of you're, you hang out yeah. in big book selling groups. That's how how did you and Steve even meet, by the way? How did we meet, Steve? I've known you for a while. I knew yeah. that. I think I think we met pretty much like in the comment section, honestly, because I, think I, so too. I remember like four or five years ago, I wasn't you know, I might have just started making videos and we were probably conversating somehow and you know how it goes. You know, you see someone doing something cool and you you send them a private message on Facebook and next thing you know you're on a green room show. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, how how old are you? Again? I don't know. If, I might have missed this part, but how old are you, Jesse? I'm 34. I'm gonna be 35 this month. So you still lived in the really good time of the 80s and the 90s, where like bookstores for some reason were like all up in the movies, like back in the day. I'm 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 not even kidding. Like never ending story. People out in the feed, by the way. This is a live show, so we'll be going in and out of the feed. But here's the first question of the night: Is name a movie from the 80s or the 90s where a bookstore was in the movie and you saw a bookstore in there? But I remember distinctly Never Ending Story being one of my favorite movies. And the kid walks into the bookstore, takes that never-ending storybook, goes to the school, and opens up probably the best movie. And it's one of the best movies ever. So let's get into Jesse's story here. And um, we'll start with the most obvious question, which is, what is your story, and how did you get started in reselling? Reselling in general or books? Reselling? Let's start with reselling, because I think that uh, it wasn't books at first, right? It was just no, random no, things, no right? way. I mean, we can go real far back. When I was a, when I was a teenager, like 13, I would buy cases of water from Sam's Club or, or one of the, the wholesale places. And I would literally stand at red lights and sell them for a dollar. So that's when I started reselling. It was a really long time ago. Eventually, you know, I, I went to flea markets. I remember doing DVDs in my early teens. And slowly but surely, I made it to eBay. And, um, I, you know, at one point, I was going through thrift stores, estate sales, flea markets, places like that, and buying anything that I could find with margin. And, you know, at that time, I was pretty successful at it, too. All I did was look at completed listings, you know what I mean? And, and I, if it's if it's at the thrift store for 5 bucks and I can sell it for 20 I purchased it. Um, slowly, we went to clothing. I, I did shoes almost primarily for two or three years. And at some point, I came across the book in a thrift store for a dollar. I, I don't know why I looked it up, but I did. It was a $50 book. I sold it, and then I was kind of obsessed with books. And you were hooked. I was hooked. That was it. Uh, turning a dollar into 50 bucks was just amazing to me. Um, and there's so many of them. So, you know, the past few years, it's all we've been doing is books. 
So how many, let me ask you this, like, <clears throat> was the bug to, at what point do you decide, I know we're probably going to jump ahead, but when did you decide, like, now I really want to open up a brick and mortar because, as I understand it, most of the really good books go to FBA. Am I right about this? Yeah, the, well, most of the higher price books are, are going to go on the internet in general. Well, we, we sell in a few other places besides Amazon. But the the thing is, on a good load, this is a good, good load. I'll take 10% out, and I have 90% that goes to a recycler. So, and, and, you know, we get paid for that, but it's like 50 a ton. It doesn't amount to too much. And it's just kind of a natural progression to say, how do I make money with this? Well, I call it trash material. <coughs> That's what it's referred to as. It's not really trash, but I, I just wanted to monetize the, the material that I couldn't put on Amazon. So, you know, it, it, it had to happen eventually. So, I so go ahead, you in. Yeah, let me jump in here real quick, um, kind of backtrack. So you said that you, out of a load, you'll usually pull out 10%. What exactly is is a load? I've heard of the the term uh, Gaylord when it comes to um, getting getting. It's like a huge box of books, right? But I've never yeah. like what what's a load mean? Is it a certain weight? Is it a certain size? And then talk about like how you're getting that. So uh, a load to me is just a full truckload, fifty three foot truck stacked full of books. We put Jeez. them in these these boxes called Gaylords. Yeah. Um, Gaylord's just a goofy name for a really big box. They're four by four by four box. They're stacked too high. You can get thirty-eight to forty-two on a on a semi, and that's what I would consider a load. And we we get books in a lot of different ways, but the most consistent uh, source of books would be um, would be by by the ton, and that's how we purchase them. Um, I'll do anywhere from one to two a month. It depends on really how fast we're moving, and and what what we're focused on. But two a month is a lot for me. I know that sounds like a lot. I know one of my good friends in Ohio does like nine a week. He's one of the reasons I, I opened the, the, the bookstore. Is that Greg? Because, yeah, Greg Murphy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, was, I was talking to him on the phone and, and he was telling me about his bookstore and, you know, he already tried it. So so he went through the process before I did and told me it was profitable. So, you know, after speaking with him, it was just a matter of time. And then ultimately there, there was a fee increase on Amazon and that just kind of kicked me in the butt. And after Amazon sent me that love letter, I think we had a... Uh, I signed the lease like three days later. We were ready to go. Mm. Wow. You were like, that's it. I'm not taking this. I'm going to create not. my own destiny, right? Yep. Good, another, another source of income. No, that's really cool. So let me ask you this. Like when, uh, okay, so clearly you have, uh, how do I say it, processes in place and all that. But where does all the sorting for the 10% to 90% thing occur? Does it occur in a back room somewhere at the house? I mean, clearly so, there's a semi-truck involved here that's like backing up. And there's a lot of stuff on it, right? Yeah, a ton of books on it. So before I moved to this location, I still have our warehouse, and that's where we did everything. So it was just the internet. So you know, you need a forklift, you want some flat ground um, for your pallet jack. So you can pull it off the truck with a forklift, it goes in the parking lot, jack it up, and then I pull it straight into the warehouse. Ideally, you have a loading dock, which makes your life so much easier. I didn't have one, and and to be honest with you, my first load I did out of storage units, like a crazy person. I didn't even have a warehouse. I rented five store units and had a truckload like, delivered there. Wait, I think you did. sent me a picture of that once, and it was like stacked up like 20 yes. feet in there. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> you said, I'm going to be here all night long, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah, that was in the summer too. I was in a, in a storage unit outside in 100-degree weather scanning books. That's that's how I started off doing books. I just wanted – I knew with a storage facility I wouldn't be stuck in a lease, and I wanted to make sure that it was profitable before I went and started signing leases with, with uh, an actual warehouse and – start paying electric and cable and everything that goes along with that. So, you know, it was it was apparent to me once I got into like the fourth Gaylord that that we were gonna make money doing this. That's good. So let's talk about all the places that you source. You said like one of the most consistent ways is the truck and the loads and the Gaylord thing. What are the so, other ways that you get books? We get books in a ton of different ways. I was watching actually the other day I was watching a uh, interview with Jeff Bezos who owns Amazon and the, the interviewer asked why he chose books to start Amazon, and he said they're unique in that there are a lot of them, and that's so true. There is so many books that we literally get them for free. People give them to me. Um, most of the time, people will read a book, and they're done with it, and they don't feel right throwing it away, so they donate them. Um, we have people that come into the store and give us books by the, by the box load. They trade us books. That's another way we do it. I have connections with people that do estate sales, like the company itself. And we get phone calls from them. It depends on the distance, whether or not I'll get that. But if it's a, you know, if it's within 20 miles and it's over a thousand bucks, we'll run a truck up and grab that. That costs me nothing. We work with every library in the state of Delaware that's below Newark. I don't know if you have a map. I don't go up that far up. 
Um, we get 100% of the discards. We get all the library sale leftovers from those. I don't know if I'm missing something. I have scanners that run out the thrift stores locally. This isn't my idea. I didn't coin it. Brian, this guy's name is Brian Young. That mm. brought this to my attention. And basically, with Bill, I set their their scanner to, to what I want it to be. They run out and purchase it, and they sell me the book for two dollars. So they could purchase it for a quarter or a dollar fifty. I pay two bucks a book after the scanner goes off. It's up to them to determine whether or not they want to make the purchase based on um, the price. And I'll turn them down if the conditions too bad. But we have we have people that come to the shop and drop off books that way. I'm, almost, I'm sure I'm missing something. Let me let me ask you, Jesse. So I I know your your main source of like your main source of volume getting the most books that's from from the gaylords and and the uh, the truckloads correct yeah that's where most of it comes in now how how do you go about you know you're getting the truckloads you're getting the gaylords but where like that's the you know without giving away oh, too many you. no you're fine the the same place you get stuff from thrift stores is one of our biggest sources i've gotten them from recyclers i i don't know if i'm going to go back to them or not they're real hit or miss because you don't know where they're getting their material from, but but thrift stores is primarily where where we get the large quantities of books. And you know, I, I'm sure I'm just going to anticipate the next question. So the cost completely depends on the type of books. Straight donations, I'm I'm willing to pay far more than shelf pulls. Do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. We're going to have gone through. I'll, yeah, I'll pay anywhere from seventy five to two and a quarter a ton. That's about our price range, and it depends on where it's coming from, how far the thrift store is to me, because it costs a lot of money to move that much weight. So the further they are the way, the, the least, the lower amount that I want to pay for them. Um, if they're shelf pulls, I'm going to pay less than if they're, they're straight donations. So, I mean, there's a lot to that. But once you've set up the connections with the thrift stores, it's, it, you, you kind of get to a point where there's so much that I have to say no. Um, fortunately, I have a lot of friends in this business, so if I get a load that I can't take, I can almost always pick up the phone and, and redirect the, the load to somebody else. Do you have a team, Jesse, or are you doing this by yourself? So my wife and I work, this is going to sound ridiculous, we work about 16 hours a day, uh, six to seven days a week. So I put in a lot of time. We have independent contractors that will go grab material for us. I'm really trying to to hire people that have their own business. So they, have the, they rent the truck, they do all the moving. So if we have a smaller load of books, like say from a library, discards, they'll run a 12-foot or 16-foot truck and get it and bring it back to me. I'll pay them. I pay people to go out and, and scan the material for us. Um, I'm, I'm slow. I, eventually, I'm going to have to get employees in here. I saw that Intuit is, is a good program for payroll. I, I can tell you that I don't want to sit in a bookstore nine hours a day, seven days a week. So someone is definitely going to be in here as soon as possible. But would most self, of, would, Let me ask you this real quick. Would it be self, safe to say that you're learning all these processes all the way through? That way you're mastering them so you can teach them to the people that you're about to hire, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly right. I there's a, I should have hired people a long time ago, to be honest. But I, in the back of my head, I wanted the uh, the Gaylord dumpers. I wanted um, the conveyor belts. I just wanted their lives to be easy. I didn't want to put them in a warehouse and have to go through everything that we go through, which is I'm, I'm doing it pretty, you know, a lot harder than the other guys do. We're basically flipping books over on tabletops. It works great, but it's not the most efficient way to do things. And, if, you know, I want to introduce people into a really fast process that's already put in place so that when you're paying them ten dollars an hour, I know for sure that they're pulling fifty or sixty or seventy dollars an hour out of, you know, the books that they're processing. I want to be more efficient before I start forking out money. Now I'll do it here in the store because they're just going to stock the shelves and, you know, ring up books. There's a little less to that, but for the warehouse itself, I, I want to be a little bit more fine tuned. Okay, um, we got a question in the feed from not a question but a remark saying, "I assume questions are at the end of this show." That's coming from Tim Miner. Uh, I've met Tim Miner before. He's awesome. Uh, no. Questions right now. Go ahead and ask them, and we will bring them out to Jesse Forbes on the show. You know, there are probably three other like reselling shows going on right now, and um, you know we have a pretty decent turnout, but it's slightly on the low side, so that's good. It means we can get some questions in there, and we can get you know you ordinarily we can barely get to the question feed because it's traveling so fast. Today, it's kind of a blessing that the question feed's going pretty slow, and we can actually see a question when it comes up. So here's the first one from Aaron Rusnak saying, "How much?" What traffic does your store get? All right, so keep in mind that I was non-existent before last Friday. Um, over the weekend, I don't know how many people this is. We sold about seven hundred dollars. It was six and some change Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I think the average person is probably spending somewhere around ten bucks. So whatever the math is there. Okay. Um, 
that's the first one. The M M Shifk one says, "What percentage of your books are selling on FBA?" And I think it was ten, right? Is that what you were saying, kind of ten? A, a, a good load. Now that there's a fee change that just came into play, so things may change a little bit. Um, I'm kind of. I think the market's going to adjust. I think everything's going to be the same. But a good load is about ten percent. Um, if, if I saw 5%, I would probably be okay with that. Okay. And from Bobby Moon says, what's the best way to manage your inventory? So I guess the inventory that's in your store right now, what's the best way you manage it? I mean, do you have like a, a SKU system or something in the computer? Like how are you figuring this whole thing out? For, you know, I, I, we've, we've gone back and forth with that for a while. For a dollar book, I, I just want to keep it as simple as possible. I'm going to change this entire store out every 30 days. So I don't want to spend a lot of time organizing you know what I mean? Because it's, basically this entire store is going to be new 30 days from now. So people don't see stale material. And the more organized I get and the more particular I get when I start grouping authors and, and, and things like that, it, it makes it more difficult to restock the store. I just want a nice, fluent, easy process. So it's loosely alphabetized. The fiction is. Nonfiction is out as categorized. And as we're going through the material in the back room, I have Gaylords out for every letter. It looks ridiculous. And we toss the fiction into that letter. I also have another section that's nonfiction. So this may go into health and fitness. This may go into biographies. That's history. So the process of scanning the material has slowed down drastically, which means I'm probably going to take in less material. But I also have another income source. So I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to work out. I think um, I think I may need some, some help considering it's, it's taking a little bit longer to get through stuff. Okay, We've got room for one more question, real quick, from Miners Treasures. How does he purchase only non-water damaged and wrinkled books before he brings the Gaylord, before he brings the books and the Gaylord's worth? Should I say? Are you looking at like, I guess what he's asking is like, how do you know some of these things aren't water damaged, or yeah. are you just kind of opening a box real quick, looking at it, and you're like, all right, that's. I mean, how are you kind of doing that? So, so I'm not sure if this is the most efficient way possible, but I'll scan. I'm completely data driven. It goes to the listing station who then categorizes it, and then, then it goes on to Amazon. So she'll she'll look through the book, and if it's water damaged or if there's excessive notation or highlights or it's ripped or torn, it goes right into the recycling pile. Okay. Gosh, while we're talking about water damage, let me ask you this. Is it raining over there, by the way? Do you hear it? Dude, I, it sounds I, like it's raining right on our, <laughs> on our hangout, dude. <laughs> is it that bad? I wish I could control it. There's, I have no place to go. The roof is everywhere. Man, it almost sounds like there is no roof. <laughs> it's kind of funny, though. Anyway. It's soothing. Um, yeah, is it, yeah. As long as it, I hope it's relaxing and not annoying. Yeah, There's, it's definitely yeah. relaxing. If you see Ray can pass out, then you'll know what Ray happened. Ray going to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we'll get back to questions here in about 10 minutes. Let's start blasting through this outline. I'd like to get uh, through this part at least. Um, so, okay, so let's talk about the finding the place to rent, the legalities, the organizing of the store, equipment needed, and hiring, empo yeah, hiring employees. Not yet. Okay, so we'll go through the first four of those, and I'll walk you through. So finding a place to rent. Talk us through that really quickly. Like, how did that happen? All right. I'm, I'm going to try to be fast. It's a lot, though. So if you're going to do a bookstore, you need multiple places within the store. You need a place to sort and process the material. You need a place to sell the material. So keep in mind, you're going to need two different places. Um, unless you have a warehouse and you want to pay to truck books to your store, which doesn't really make sense financially. You kind of want to do it all in one spot. So you don't, you don't really need a store. You need a store with a big back room, at least 1,000 square feet to, to operate in. You don't want little doors, like a normal human-sized door doesn't work. Gaylords are huge. You need double doors that open like this. You need flat concrete, unless you have a forklift. Um, and, and basically, you just need to be able to get a lot of stuff in an area very efficiently and, and easily. Okay. So that's how you figure out a good place to rent. Are there any bookstores that have the sorting facilities like integrated no I, th I think the average bookstore purchases material from the general public or they take donations or they do a trade program so that it gets stuff a lot slower than we do and and that's I think that's how they operate I'm pretty unique in that I, I buy truck loads. okay cool uh, let's go to the legality of the whole thing like how did you get this whole thing legal and you know did you get there's a book there's a bookstore need a terrible amount of insurance like what's going on like talk uh, to us about that so I, I think that's going to vary wildly from state to state. I'm not an attorney. Like, for instance, Delaware doesn't have sales tax, so I probably have to go through a lot less than other people do. Um, I have a million-dollar insurance policy. It's not expensive on an annual basis. It actually is very easy. You can do it as quick as, you know, you get car insurance. A quick Google search will take care of that. Um, we had an LLC, so instead of going through some of the stuff other people had to, I filed what's known as a DBA. It stands for doing business as. So I just, I'm doing business as the, the dollar book shuffle. And, and that was taken care of. Um, obviously, you need to pay your taxes. 
and there's a ton of software that will help you do that. Intuit uh, comes to mind. I think that's probably the go-to for, for payroll and taxes and things. What about, um, let me jump in real quick. What about um, doing business in your town? Were there any permits or like when you when you start up a brick and mortar, I mean, you, you know, you rent out a place. I mean, obviously you're selling stuff. There's people coming in right. buying stuff. Is there, you know, besides insurance, are there any when permits I, or so, know, anything of so that nature? The name, I, I wish, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It starts with a P. It's in your local courthouse or it's in my local courthouse. It's in our, our county. I went in and said, I'm going to start a bookstore. I have an LLC. She said, you need to follow DBA and gave me a very small list of paperwork to fill out. Uh, it was it was a few fees. I mailed some things, um, and, and that was it. But I, again, I, I think that's gonna gonna be very different for a lot of people depending on where they live. I think since I'm going to my county, even I think this county in Delaware may be different from the county next to me. Right. But, um, but if you, if you Google where to file a DBA, it starts with a P. I'm not gonna try to say it because it's gonna sound ridiculous. That's that's the the lady that I had spoken to. And then you know, like I said before, we we're corporations, so that. That makes things a little bit easier in terms of, of popping up businesses. Did um did you have to have like a fire marshal come in or anything like that to No. You know, if you're doing business. I always thought a fire marshal had to come in to like check the, the, the exits and the safety and, and stuff like that. I know for like you know, obviously like for restaurants and stuff like that, it's a lot more um kind of complicated, right? Inspectors and stuff, but I didn't know if there was any inspections that you had to pass or anything like that to, to have a, you know, a brick and mortar set up in your town. And again, it might differ probably from county to county, but just from your experience, you didn't have to. So the, the, the landlord, I think took care of a lot of that. They, she did post something okay. on the, um, something on the wall that has to do with fire inspection. So that was taken care of by her. Okay. What about the organization of the shelves behind you and stuff like that? Are you kind of are you, are you kind of like doing what? Have you ever gone to a place called Fry's Electronics? You know what I'm talking about? The, the large electronics oh. store. Yeah, it's the really large electronics store, but they have this like walk of like I call it like the walk of shame. Like at the end, you can't get to the cash registers until you walk down this enormous aisle of like candy and sweets and like all this stuff and all the you know like iPod chargers and it's stuff that you might actually need. But you can't exit the store really without going through this aisle. I make, so my question to you is, do you kind of make these people kind of swing around your store and then they come back to the exit somehow? Like, how does that work with your yeah, store? Yeah, the, the exit's all the way in the back. Cash register is right here to my left. So they, 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 <laughs> have, to walk through, they have to walk through everything <laughs> to get to me. And, and that was done intentionally. I, I wanted to, My cash register is off towards the bulk bins. I wanted to see those kids' bulk bins. We have... I, I want to say 1,500 pounds of kids' books. We sell them for $10 a bag. It's, it seems to be a pretty good moneymaker. So, um, you know, I'm glad. And if they have children with them, it's at a low enough level so that the kids can see it and start grabbing stuff. I did oh, that intentionally too. Do you um do you have any, you know, in, in, in the internet marketing world, there's something called a, uh, a tripwire. And even like big companies like, you know, McDonald's have them. And, and, and essentially what it is is a really cheap item that you might even lose money on. And the point of point of it is to get somebody in the door you know, they grab that item that you might lose money on, but you know that a certain percentage of them are going to buy maybe a book bundle or some type of profit maximizer. Have you gotten that far? Or are you yeah, right? that's cool that you asked that. And we were actually having that conversation earlier. So there are books like Fifty Shades of Grey and some other things that lot really well on eBay and will, will net you, you know, several dollars a book, which is far more than a dollar that I'm going to make here. The thing is, is people come in for that, they ask for that, and then they buy 10 other things. Like I, like I told you before, they're spending $10. So even though I know that I can lot certain sets together, Harry Potter is another one. I, I don't know what it is on eBay, but I'm going to assume if you have the entire set, you're going to make more than a dollar a book. Uh, stuff like that, I'll deliberately put out knowing full well that people are going to say, do you have it? I can walk them over to it, and then they purchase other stuff in the store. So I wouldn't anticipate that question. It's a really good question. Well, that's cool. You should make your entire store be like a maze. Yeah, just make, make them get lost. <laughs> I'll yell from the cash register. Yeah. Follow my voice. <laughs> like, when you ever been on those, like, Rick, have you ever been in like a mirror maze when you're a kid? Yeah. Those things are terrifying, man. Anyway, um, okay. So now uh, I think it's a perfect time to stop for a second. Let's ask a question. Actually, I'm going to keep going, but ask your questions now. And as they come up, I'll try to ask them. Or, yeah. Okay. So um, let's talk about. The equipment needed. Obviously, you need a cash register. You need some shelves, some cashier island looking thing, right? I mean, you I guess, could, right? Yeah, yeah, you need quite a bit. Uh, you, you're gonna if you buy them the way that I do, you're gonna need um, 
you're gonna need you're at least gonna need access to a forklift you can run them you need a pallet jack you can get them pretty inexpensively used um you're gonna need a cash register you need shelves shelves are probably the most expensive thing that that you're gonna come across if you want to open a bookstore i was fortunate enough to find one that went out of business um it was just a regular call they wanted me to purchase their their excess inventory i was just going to scan it for amazon and see what i could pull out of that and then uh, we, we struck a deal on the shelving okay. so i got lucky there well, that's good um so we have a question coming in from bobby moons is do you advertise what's uh, your quick answer to that one so uh, we do facebook ads i'm only spending ten dollars an day and it's working very very well i anticipated um spending more i wanted to do local paper it's like 30 thirty dollars a week or something for an eighth of a page i'm not going to do that there's no need facebook's working perfectly i said what local up? paper like raken when's the last time you like read the local paper dude? i don't read it <laughs> yeah i know i mean it's still a business right so i mean people <laughs> that's people, crazy i think it's like the older crowd right yeah you know like my my grandfather so reads it every I think single you're day speculating, raken. yeah i think your grandfather might be the only person that's reading the newspaper Ever. I don't know. Let's see what the let's see what the people in the comments say. Do you guys read the newspaper at all? Um, but let me take a step back because I know a lot of people are probably thinking, you know, Facebook advertising. What do you mean by that? Like Facebook's like social media. That's where you go to like talk to your friends and stuff. Um, people don't realize that Facebook's become a massive empire because of their advertising platform. Yeah. That's how they earn their revenue. Um, talk about that. How would a local business like a bookstore? Uh, advertise on Facebook and what's your strategy there Jesse so starting off I, I just did a 25 mile radius from my store so anyone that's within 25 miles is gonna see my ad um, eventually I'm gonna run to the entire audience uh, we're at ten dollars a day that's it and gee, I've done a ton of Facebook advertising in the past for, for digital products and t-shirts and things and usually we'll start small and then you know we'll increase the ad revenue and compare that to what we're making and I'll continue to increase it until I hit a sweet spot and then we, we'll, we'll stop right there and then I will get very specific and see who's responding to the ad for books generally it's women with children for some reason so I would probably get more and more specific there um, and, and just get better with it over time women with children okay <clears throat> do you think I mean when you look at who walks into your store is it mostly women with children yeah oh, that's very that's and, and they're they're dragging their husbands along. Dad normally gets two books. She'll get like ten or fifteen, and, the, and then the kids will will fill a bag. That's wow, something that works out. that's pretty cool. That's that's not bad. Um, just make sure Fifty Shades of Grey is not in the child bin. You know what I'm saying? I don't yeah, know I know, right? that's a good one. <laughs> um, so okay, so let's talk about um, next goals and plans because you said bookstore has been effectively open for about what seems to be a week and a half or something like that. About a week and a half, something yeah. like that. Um, what are your goals and plans for the over the next three to six months to grow the store? Goals and plans to grow it. I, I'm going to continue to run the ad. Um, I, I, I think th here's the thing with bookstores. It's not like it's not a thing where you just come in and you buy a couple things and then you leave and you never come back. People are crazy when it comes to books. There's collectors that have thousands of them. They read them and they're done and then they come back for more. So for me, I just need to get enough people knowing that I exist that read and I'm certain that they're, they're going to return time and time again. I've been open for a short period of time and I, I'm meeting people and I know them by their first name now um, because they're coming in over and over again. That's why I think it's so important that I keep things restocked and, and get a fresh store at least every 30 days. For okay, I might be jumping ahead here on a question, but like, here's a question from just me. Can a bookstore ever like sponsor something like a 5K run or something that's going on through the town or, you know what I'm saying? Like, that would be cool. I, have a, I got a friend that does a bookstore and he, he did a food drive, which was interesting. So, I mean, if I can stick out in the local community, I'm definitely going to do it. I would do anything. Food pretty interesting. Maybe people bring you cans and you give them, like, a bag and you're like, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, you, there's and, some uh, ways you Santa can do it, And Santa, too. Right? And uh, during Christmas, he had he brought him Santa and let him take pictures, let the kids take pictures with him for free. So, uh, you know, that was interesting, too. Well, definitely, as time progresses and I get my systems in place, which is probably the most important thing to me right now, getting things processed, getting this, getting this stuff out, getting the new stuff in, getting things on Amazon and – and figuring out what's going to FBA versus Merchant Fulfilled. And and at, right now, that's my primary focus. But as I get more comfortable and I get more help, I'm definitely going to reach out and do more and more things. Okay. So the, where this bookstore is, we're talking like small town America, or are we talking like kind of like big metropolis? Like how would you describe it out there to the to I, people in the I have I have an exact answer. Facebook told me there's 47,000 people in 25 miles from here. So that gives you kind of an idea. Okay. I'll go 50 okay. miles after I run through that audience and, 
and we'll see where that's at. Are you are you um building any custom audiences right now off of Facebook? Are you driving them to your website or anything like that? Or to be honest with you, the Facebook is driving me nuts because in the past I've always been able to count clicks. I could retarget once they've gone to my webpage. I could I could do so much more than what I can do here. The only thing I can do is tell the world I exist and wait for them to come in. That's my click when they come in and and they purchase books. So I, I don't really have any hard data. My only data that I have to go off of right now is what did I spend today and what am I making? And, and right now there's margin. So I'm going to continue uh, to increase Facebook. Now, I'm, I'm also, I, I fully intend to do other things. If a truck pulls up, I'm going to take a picture of the truck, put it on the fan page and say, you know, new load in, we're going to, we're, we're about to restock the store in the next week. And I would boost that to the same audience. So I'm going to treat it. I, I want to be just the guy down the road that's a small time bookseller. That's also your friend. That's kind of the persona I want to give out. Not this huge corporation. Do you what, know what I mean? I got an idea. Why don't, um, you know, you put a little sign in sheet at the exit and it's like, leave your email here for, uh, you know, a 25% off coupon, your next purchase plus any, you know, keeping up with all the news for said bookstore. Right. That's a good idea. Yeah. I was going to do if the, if the Facebook ad wasn't effective, I was going to run one that just gave everyone a free book for showing up and I was going to pray that they got more, but, Fortunately, well, you were the bookstore that actually gave someone a free book for every time they showed up, but they bought other stuff. I mean, there's so many ways you can really do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just to get them in the door. Yeah, I can tell you this: I'm so surprised at the the amount of people that showed up. I did not think we would get the response that we did, and I didn't think people were going to spend ten dollars a piece at a dollar bookstore. I'm thinking I need 200 people to walk in here to buy one book. That's not the case at all. You know, they're filling they're, they're literally filling boxes. We had a guy get 70 books that was not a reseller, it's just a collector. It's crazy. Hey, Man, um, does it make you think like maybe you missed those 70, like something's up? Yeah, it scares me a little bit. Not really. <laughs> I mean, there's so many books. <laughs> I, have, um, I had a scanner in here the other day. I just let him scan. Really? I, I like kind of a jerk. Oh, oh man. Yeah, well, I, have, I, have, uh, I have people that are running around locally in thrift stores. If he's in here scanning my stuff, then my guys can go out and get the stuff from the thrift store. If he wants to waste his time, it's fine with me. And then it also tells me if I'm doing a good job or not because if he comes to the counter, I know that I'm missing stuff, you know? I've actually gone to a, uh, a bookstore kind of like yours before. But the funny thing is they didn't even know about selling on FBA. And like I started scanning. I was on my 90-day trip and the guy comes out and he's like, I just want to be a nice guy and let you know I don't want you to waste your time. Like there's no profitable books here. Like I went through them all. <laughs> and I left crazy. with like 40 books, dude. Because Did he, he really? didn't real because he only knew about merchant. He didn't know about FBA. Oh, man. But do you, no do you know what's interesting? If you scan a load of books and let it sit and come back to it a few months later, you'll find more books. You really will. The market he, does this. But I felt it was so awkward because like I'm leaving with 40 bucks and him and his wife are looking at each other like, what the heck? I thought he was, so, <laughs> was he mad? I would laugh. I wouldn't be mad. I actually I told him like I was a nice guy after him. Like I said, like, listen, I'm going to tell you something, but you've got to let me get all these books. And he's like, all right, cool. And I'm like, and I, I put him on FBA and I <laughs> told him, I felt bad, man. Cause I was just oh, like, man. but anyways. That is pretty funny. Um, there's some questions about rents. Here's a, a remark. So in the sun by the beach says rents are so high in Miami. I don't think that there are any used bookstores. So let's, let's get on the subject of rent for one second here. What's the historical rent increase? Um, I guess you probably looked this up before getting into um, what, the space that you bought, but what is it? Is it 1%, 2% a year? Like, you know, are there stipulations on your lease? Yeah, I, I'm not, I looked at the price per square foot per year and that's what I based off of. I, I don't know what the increases over time on retail. I but really you have don't. a lease, I, which is guaranteed price, or is it a uh, subject to five, five year? Uh, five year. Five yeah. year. Okay. Well, but I negotiate very different. Most people in my situation are I don't. Uh, we, this the the people that are in this complex will probably let you go month to month, but they gave me an astronomical number. And when you when you put this much material in here, I'm not going anywhere. You know what I mean? I can't just load this in my truck and leave. I'm stuck here for a very long time. So I did everything I can to get the rent down as much as possible. So I agree to a lot just to make it affordable for me. They also threw in um, two months free, which is really cool. So, you know, I, I probably, I could have, I most likely could have gone month to month. Now, obviously without you releasing your actual numbers, cause it's not really any of our business, but how, how rough is the overhead for you? Not in terms of the actual number, but is there pressure on you to, to really, to sell yeah. a lot of books, whatever that is, well, because you well, know how it is some, you, you know, you know what I'm getting at, right? Yeah, I do. If if things continue the way that they are, I'm, I'm going to be I'll be able to cover the rent and profit more than I would have had I had recycled the material, which is awesome. You don't expect that your first 30 days. And I, I think one thing this helps us too, as far as the rent, there is a flea market literally right there. 
So I'm an independent store. I'm open seven days a week, but they bring in foot traffic too on the weekends. But I think they may affect the rent because it's not, you know, it, it's not the best location on the planet. So that helps us keep the rent down, if that makes any sense. Okay. Are you on a side of a street or corner? You're I'm on the corner. corner. I'm on the corner of a major Ooh, highway. Nice. I'm, on, I'm on a major highway and then a, and then a little road. Oh, that's really cool. That's always a plus, huh? You have like a big sign in front or is it is it easy to see? Huge. Or I, get, I get two eight-foot signs on, on both corners that run along the building. Okay. That's pretty good. And then, and then they don't give me much time, but there's a marquee up there and it flashes. It says one dollar bookstore and disappears like ten seconds later. So whatever that's worth, which is probably <laughs> okay. So from the short amount of time that you've been open, what time? What are the best types of books that are selling in your store as of right now? So my intentions, what, first opening was I was going to scan all the books into a spreadsheet and then take a look at the ISBNs and just kind of get an idea of what people want. But they were coming up to the counter too fast, and I just wanted to get them out, so I didn't do it. I think, based off of what I've seen so far, fiction is, is probably sells the best. I, I was think, speculating it was going to be fiction. Yeah, I think that they want trade back versus the the hardcover. Most people, I mean, they still purchase it, but they don't want the, the thicker books as much as they want the little tiny mm -hmm. trade back. I think it just feels better in their hand. So I most of it is uh, is fiction, trade back, and um, children's books. But they do purchase nonfiction. When you really know is when you restock it, I think. Not when they're coming to the counter. And come to think of it, I restock more fiction, so that's definitely true. Do you think if you had a spare second in your day after these 16-hour days like vanish, that you might, in order to prevent like a rake and profit from coming in and like taking 40 books, like just start scanning down the aisles of your store? Because like you said, the markets fluctuate, right? No, Ranks yeah. change, and all kinds of things start happening. Like books that were 1 million rank might become 500,000, but they might also go to 2 million. Um, and the prices accordingly change just as much as the rank changes. So what's your view on that? I mean, or are you kind of welcoming people to come scan your store and take things that maybe you were like, oh man, I probably could have sent that one in or merchant fulfilled it. I mean, if, if I missed it and they're gonna, then I'm not going to, you know, it, before the store would have gotten recycled and it's only going to be here for a month. I just feel like, I feel like I'm going to get a higher yield if I scan fresh material. You know what I mean? Okay. So I highly doubt it. What I what I thought I wanted to get really good at eBay is another way to to get rid of material. So I since we're grouping authors apparently, which I really don't want to do, but since we're doing that, I was gonna pull the authors at, off of the shelf after like right before we restock and then put those on eBay. So as far as going back over the store, that may be the only thing we do is is try to eBay lots. Um, what's stopping you from getting into CDs? I mean, a lot of bookstores have a CD section. Right, I do. Yeah, there, there's there's CDs and DVDs. I want to say I want to say there's like 1,500 CDs and however many DVDs fit on the rack. Probably like six or seven hundred DVDs. The they the thrift stores will give them to us. I don't think they're doing it intentionally, but it's, they're thrown in with the books. So I don't get a ton of them, but I do get them. And then libraries, I get it. I get a lot of CDs and, and DVDs from libraries. I forgot about them. Do you ever get a person that like pulls up in a really weird like nineties car with like nineties garb and then he pulls over like a case logic that has like a hundred CDs in there? Do you remember those days with like the yeah, case logic thing? I had it. Everyone had that. Like you were actually pretty cool if you had that in the back seat of your car. You're like, oh, check out nope. my collection, you know? Anyway. Um, I always think it's kind of funny. Like the other day I was in I was coming out of the gym and uh, someone had the case logic uh, visor thing, you know, like the flip up visor in your car. And it had like 15 discs in it. I was like, man, this dude is like really stuck. <laughs> like back in the, this is like hot tub time machine, the guy right here. Anyway, so I thought that was kind of entertaining at best. Um, so, hey, Raken, real quick. People need to do something to the video, don't they? We're going to take one break. I here think they, they definitely need to do something. We're at the 38 minute mark right now. So we just passed the halfway mark. If you guys are enjoying this video, do us a big favor and give us a thumbs up down below. Looks like we've had about 70 to 80 people watching live the whole time. So we appreciate you guys watching. So, uh, yeah, if you like it, hit the thumbs up. Also, if you have any questions, be sure to drop a question in the comment section down below. We are going through there and also be sure to check the description area as well and get our free book 100 amazing items to resell you'll probably That's find some right items that here. you like cool there you go so yeah little tiny little micro commercial right there um and that's another thing that's really good about the green room <laughs> hangouts is that you know we can I love doing these green room shows because it opens my eyes, everyone's eyes to a lot of different ways to make money. That's what the green room is all about. Really ultimately is that, you know, we don't like to be pigeonholed in like one single stream of income. And so 
finding out how people make money out there is really interesting to us, whether it be digital or even brick and mortar, right? We always want to get uh, you know people's stories and uh, experiences on the show, and then hopefully you guys out there get ideas from that, right? Um, so uh, let's talk about, let's go further into this real quick. Let's, let me see if I have any more questions um, in the feed. If you got a couple, okay, I have room for about two questions, maybe three questions right now. So go ahead and ask them if you got them, guys. Um, so what are your thoughts with this big change with Amazon and the long-term, you know, that long-term storage fee? Was that three weeks ago or was it, no, it was a month ago. How far ago was this big change um, for uh, Jesse? It, um, I, I didn't take it very well for the first 24, 48 hours. I was very upset, to be honest with you. Uh, the first thing I did was I looked at previous loads, and I pretended like I basically I downloaded it in an Excel sheet, and I deleted everything that would fall below the fee structure. Does that make sense? All the six, seven, eight dollar books. I, I just eliminated them. And you know, we're shipping books by the pallet. So when you make a dollar book, it sounds kind of dumb. Like most people would not want to ship that in, but we're doing it pretty efficiently, and we're sending a pallet of books to Amazon for like eighty bucks. So it makes sense. You spend eighty dollars to ship a thousand pounds of books, even if they're all worth a dollar, it's still incredibly profitable. So that's why we did it. I know that a lot of people ask why in the world would you sell a six dollar book? That's why. So I, I look back at our previous uh, our previous loads and I eliminated all the low dollar stuff and I also eliminated everything that was over like three million, two and a half to three million that was a little bit lower price, like maybe fifteen, twenty dollar price range and below. And then I looked at what I had, and I was I was not very happy with that. Um, I don't think, for me, everyone's situation is different. It depends on where you're purchasing your books, how much you're paying to get it to you, what you're paying per ton, how fast you are processing. A lot of things matter. But for me, I I, I didn't like the margins under the new scenario. Um, I don't know that if those. I'm pretty sure the market's going to adjust, and those lower dollar books are just going to pop up a little bit, and they'll still be in the dollar price range. So, in other words, they still will exist today, but. I didn't know for sure, so I had to look at it in the way that I did, and um, and 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 that's one of the reasons why I moved so quickly on the dollar bookstore. I started Merchant Fulfilling. I started selling on other platforms like Abe's Books, Half.com, eBay.com, um, Alibris. I'm sure I'm missing some. Barnes and Nobles. We put all of our Merchant Fulfilling material on all those platforms, um, just so that I'm everywhere in case in case buyers decide to shift because of the price increase. I'm already going to be positioned to to sell on those platforms, but. But that's what we did, and as time passed, I became more and more relaxed because I, I think that the market, I know that the market is going to adjust, and, and we're probably not going to see a huge difference, and this is just going to be added income to, to the pre-existing. So what would you do to, okay, so you figured out that this increase comes along and freaks you out. You make a decision to eliminate basically a tier of your business, right? That, and, that the fees uh, would, uh, that the fees would right. um, affect, yeah. So a certain tier of your business is gone. What did you do? Did you basically have them burn it or destroy it? Or did you have them sent to you to where you can get them on this bookstore? Burn it. No, no, the right term is exterminate it, right? You can, they exterminate the book. Throw it in yeah. the fire pit. I think they liquidate it. I bet you they sell it. Well, either way, um, I based it on I based it on the merchant fulfilled price because if I get it sent back to me, I'm perfectly content, you know, letting a book sit on our shelf for seven months. You know what I mean? So if I can make money on the merchant side, I, I think I put it at like three or four dollars is what I wanted to net. I paid the fifty cents to bring it back to me. Um, and I didn't pay too much attention to rank. Anything below that, I destroyed. I did this with spreadsheets, like the most difficult way possible. It turns out Amazon has a little button under your settings, and they'll do it for you. It takes five seconds, so I did it uh, like the hardest way imaginable. But that's basically what we did. So you know, to, to summarize all that, all that yapping. If I can make three dollars merchant fulfilled, I sent it back to me. Otherwise, it just got destroyed. Um, the it still costs you to let Amazon take care of it, right? Fifteen cents. Fifteen cents so per, pay, and then you did yeah, probably like hundred thousand. Yeah, so you pay like one hundred fifty bucks per one thousand, which you know it's better than fifty cents. It's way better. Yeah, than 50 absolutely, cents. absolutely. Um, Jillian's saying hi to Sun by the Beach, who's in the actual uh, comment feed. Do you have any Dean Koontz? I like Dean Koontz. You ever read any Dean Koontz books? I used to read Dean Koontz back in high school. I, I have. I have like a million of them in here I, no, I, I haven't read i could read it if it's good if you say oh, it's good, good I'll check it out. pretty good i want to say they made he made one called creature if i'm not mistaken so creatures are really really old school dean coon's book that's pretty good um okay my favorite author right now that's fiction is uh ernst klein he's actually out of austin texas and he made a book called ready player one and a book called armada but ready player one is super good 
to the point where it's being made into a movie and Steven Spielberg is going to produce it for 2018. Anyway, That's cool. when you trust me, you heard it here. Like that is my favorite <laughs> book of all time is Ready Player One. Um, all right, so let's talk about um, what will you do? So after these fee hikes in Amazon, you talked about what you're doing differently. You're going to try to expose, you know, and have your presence in all these other platforms, right? Yeah, so yeah, no matter yeah. where the people go or the shift occurs, at least you'll be poised to have some inventory there, correct? Or yep. some exposure. Is that what I heard you say? Yep, all the merchant fulfilled material will be there. And and it, it turns out that most of the stuff that we're getting now is going to merchant fulfilled. There has to be a pretty big spread between FBA and merchant fulfilled for me to FBA the material now. And it's just because I'm a little scared at the moment, to be honest with you. When the market adjusts, I'm, I'm probably going to go back to 100% FBA if, if things work out the way that I, I think they're going to. How long do you think this is going to take in, in your eyes for this adjustment, right? Because markets always change. Um, I think. I think three, I, I think a conservative guess is like three to six months. I think that that's, but you know, what's interesting. Like I, I increased this, the, my prices for merchant fulfilled today. And I saw some really large sellers who jumped on board like that, which is encouraging to me. I mean, so I'm not going to, I guess I shouldn't say their names, but you know, guys have millions of books, just increased <clears throat> all of their inventory immediately on those listings. I went and I, I, I went through a few of the lower price books that I knew went up and it seems that sellers are aware of the, at least aware of the fee hike. I don't think it's going to affect people buying it. I really don't. I don't think a dollar is going to scare people off. The people are going to continue to read. So let me ask you a question. Moving forward, um, you know, what are some factors that you're going to be looking at that would determine if you buy or pass on a book? You know, maybe some factors will differentiate, such as price. Um, but let's talk about rank a little bit. Let's talk about condition, number of sellers. Um, talk about analyzing the books that you're going to buy. You know, outside of the, you know, the the loads and whatnot say you have you know somebody go to a thrift store contractor okay. so for them we're paying to a book but if i were to go into a thrift store and i paid the prices everybody else does i you rank is is like a five-hour conversation so right. I, I guess the easy answer is the higher the rank the more money i i want to make for that book do you know what i mean yeah, so sure. you know i i sell five million rank books every single month and there are people that won't touch them but for me to list that it needs to be like 50 bucks and i i completely understand that if i list a hundred five million rank books i may only sell five but i list a hundred which you know we see we bulk list inventory into our system we're, we're able to identify them very quickly so it takes two seconds to do it i list a hundred i may have to throw out you know the vast majority of them but i've made 250 dollars on that decision so I, I don't ignore high rank books and i think a lot of people do that um, and then on the opposite side of the spectrum, the lower the rank, the quicker the money I'm going to make, the, the, the littler my margin needs to be to list that book. So I'll go a dollar, right, if it's ranked 10,000 because I'm going to sell it in the next 10 minutes. But I would never do that if it was, you know, two million. I, I, would, I just wouldn't want a book on my shelf that I'm only going to make a buck for for two million, at least for Amazon. Right. Uh, out here, I'd stick it on the shelf and, and just recycle it every 30 days. How are you going to deal yeah. with – yeah, no, I, I definitely get it. I definitely get it. Um, how are you going to deal with the long-term storage fees? Because they're coming, what, every six months? Yeah, there's there's a every... small there's a small fee, and six months there's another <clears throat> one for twelve. So when when I I do FBA books, I'm not doing it as much. We're actually shipping by the box now. That's how uh, that's how subtle I I send things in the, to Amazon. But um, you, I guess I guess we're basing most of it off of rank and spread. So if there is a five or six dollar difference between merchant fulfilled and FBA, for instance, if I can make twelve fifty um, on Amazon, which will leave me with like four bucks, four or five dollars, and on the merchant side I'm at a dollar, I'm going to FBA it. It's five times the value. But if that's anywhere near close, I'm probably going to merchant fulfill it. I'm cutting off um, FBA depending on the actual price. I'll still send in three million ranked books that I think I can get fifty dollars for, and I'll tell you why I'm sending the higher ranked books in because. For a three million or four million or five million rank book, the buyer doesn't come around very often. And when they do, I want to beat merchant fulfilled pricing and I want to get it to them in two business days. I want to be the next sale. And I feel like if I'm in their warehouse, I'm positioned to be that next sale. And I fully understand that I'm probably going to have to spend 15 cents to destroy them. So, you know, I'm doing the opposite of probably what a lot of people are telling you. If I got a high priced book, um, and it's a high, even if it's a high rank, it's going to FBA. The lower price books, I need a spread before I will I will ship it to Amazon. Does that make sense? I, I tend. I well, we live like in a world of now. It makes perfect sense. A world of now means it doesn't matter if you're old, and, you know, young, whatever. Uh, you're a book collector or just a casual reader. You know, when you want something, you want it now. You're like right. just the way it is. You know. 
Um, let's talk about biggest mistakes that people might uh, make or that usually people people make when they're starting a book selling business. Now, let's not talk about a you know, brick and mortar store here, but just a yeah. book selling business in general to resell books. Um, could you highlight maybe three biggest mistakes that you've seen people um, do when they want I've to get into this business? I can tell you some mistakes I've made, but the, the one that drives me nuts is don't buy anything over a million. That books over a million sell every day. I, like I said, I sell five million ranked books every single month. So I, I wouldn't be so dependent on rank, especially if you're merchant fulfilling. Um, it at least takes time to learn rank and, and how that relates to price. Don't just stop at a million. Uh, the, one of my biggest mistakes was I paid too much for loads. I didn't pay attention to the distance because it costs a lot of money to get it to me. Um, that was a huge mistake. Uh, Another one I did was I purchased an FBA seller's duds from a recycler. I'll never do that again. This is material that's already been scanned through. Um, so it's good that you kind of, you, you don't want to really interview them hard, but you want to ask questions before you wire the money to the to whoever it is you're, you're purchasing from. Okay. Um, so we have a question in the feed <laughs> coming from Jillian, who's one of my subscribers um, or my primary subscribers. But uh, could you ask him? To save all of his hardcover Dean Koontz books for me, yeah, hey man, this I, is how you stand out in the in Delaware, man. You start doing these like fun things, and you can put it on Facebook, like, "Hey, someone really wanted Dean Koontz stuff, and here it is. I'm sending someone some Dean Koontz stuff." I, I um, think I could probably put fifty pounds of Dean Koontz in a box. What? Pretty the easily. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Hard, it wouldn't even be that much if it's hardcover. Hardcover, hardcover really? I bet it's in here. Like you're making wow. me want to go look. I think I I seem too much. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Uh, another question is kind of unrelated to uh, books, but it's in its relation to reselling and just being a content creator. And I guess we can all three echo in on this one, but uh, it's directed towards me and Jesse. But Ray, can I'll let you answer this one first from Ryan? Basically saying, what kind, com what computer do you choose for your reselling business, and why? I'm trying to decide to buy one. I would just really appreciate the insight, Ray. Can yeah, so I used to have uh, Windows computers. Oh my, so my whole entire you know, reselling career. And I used to have issue after issue, viruses, and it would slow down and it would break and it wouldn't turn on and just issue after issue. And it came to a point where I bought literally like three laptops within like three months and it just all kept breaking, buying like three, $400 ones. So I finally switched over to a MacBook Pro and I have never had a problem since in about probably coming up on two years now. So I use a MacBook Pro. Why? super quick it's literally almost like impossible to get viruses it's great for video editing it's compatible with a lot of stuff I mean it's just it's great I, I mean it just does the job and I don't have any problems what about you Jesse I'm a weirdo man I use Linux I have a dual I, I use just Toshiba uh, satellites <laughs> um, I get a new one weirdo. every few years <laughs> uh, we got. I have a dual boot system, so I go to Linux for just about everything if I need Photoshop or I need to edit something I, I have to do it in Windows because those type of programs just aren't made for Linux, but most of what I do is, is Linux based. I just I like the operating system better. But if you want a good cheap computer that that, that works fine, Toshiba satellites are, are a pretty good pretty good uh, computer for under, under two hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. I think I had one for college. I don't know, but anyway, yeah, it was a good, it was a decent computer for relatively cheap. He's right. Yeah, it does work, man. I mean, I replaced the battery, and that's about exactly it. the battery. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one that goes really quick in that computer. Um, well, that's cool. Um, I'm a MacBook Pro person as well. Um, I think Eric, uh, college picker, MacBook Pro person. It's funny, Raken, because you were about to get a MacBook Pro on computer number two, and then we got back to you. You're like, I'm about to go to Best Buy. I'm gonna get a computer. It's gonna be awesome. And then you go there, and we're all like waiting, and we're like, What did you get, Raken? And you're like. I got an Acer. It was like three hundred. Like, oh, jeez, man! <laughs> and then that's the one that broke like it. so fast. Yeah, and then you finally did it. So that was pretty cool. Um, but anyway, so yeah, you know, fantastic show. Honestly, Jesse, I thought this was a great show. Um, really, um, just eye-opening. I want to make sure that we give uh, a second for maybe a couple more questions to roll in from the feed. And how can people follow your journey, Jesse? Like people, you know, that want to get more into books or maybe have general. <laughs> want to get into groups on Facebook, like give some advice here. Like how can people follow you and where would you tell them to go if they want to get some really good book reselling advice? Really good book reselling advice. My, uh, my friend of mine, his name is Greg Murphy. He, he runs a, a Facebook group called bus. I'm sorry, bus proof flipping. It's hard for me to say it right now for some reason. Uh, yeah. how do you, well, hold on, hold on. Or a backtrack, but buzz, what bus proof, uh, book flipping. I think it's the name of the group. If you put in bus proof bus, 
Bust. <laughs> bust proof. Okay, bust proof. Yeah, okay. I like buzzed when I said the word bust for some reason. <laughs> bust strength. proof. Say it again. Bust proof. Bust. Like getting bust. hit by like a bus. Big bust. Boom. You got hit by a bust. So you're bust proof. Oh. Bust proof book flipping. That's what I spend most of my time oh. in there. Okay, uh, okay. That, that's the book flipping group that um that I primarily get to. There's a few of them out there, but, yeah, but he's a good guy. Greg's a really he, good guy. He's a legitimate. He's a really good guy, and he's helpful. And he's so. partnered with Kevin, right? Kevin and him, they they put out a course together. I remember I helped promote it way back, um, probably like eight, nine months ago. But he's got some really, really good information. This course is really, really good too. I don't know. Did you ever go through that one that him and uh, Mr. Young what, did? Uh, the Brian did. I did not. Uh, I just kind of jumped into it. Brian. I called him Kevin. I'm sorry. Brian Young. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did see that a while ago. But no, I, I just jumped into it. Cool. 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 Um, so that's how they can, and you'll, they'll find you in that group too, right? Yeah, you, you can. My name's Jesse Forbes. You can shoot me a friend request. I'm usually pretty social on Facebook. <laughs> if I, it, it takes me a while to get back. Normally, it's in the evenings, just because I'm running around playing with books all day. But I'm more than happy to to be helpful. We have a question here that's probably that could you could probably one. give an hour answer on this one, but it, try to keep it kind of curt and short here. Um, but okay. Bobby Moon says, "What gets you motivated to keep on working every day?" That's Coffee, buddy. Coffee, a lot of coffee. coffee. Coffee and sales. Nothing puts me in a better mood than sales. And turning into a librarian, you know that you're gonna have yeah. like the little glasses where you have to like put them down and like this, you know. I know, right? Um, you, do you have gray hair yet? Yeah, yeah, it's gonna get worse, I'm sure. If, if I Do stay, so. aren't librarians raking usually female though? That I've always come in contact for some well, reason. I never, almost never see male. It's, it's almost like a, it's like a sixty forty split at my library. At ours, it's all ladies, it's all older ladies. I work with every <laughs> library in our in our area. Are they I bring nice? Them are the library are library people nice to do business with? I would say that ninety five percent of them are. Yeah, Spe I right, speak so directly. I go to the director. Yeah, I go to the director, who is always nice because I'm, I'm solving a huge problem for them. And then the friends of the library do what they do because, you know, they support the library, so they're they're generally nice. Let, let me ask you about that. Is that typically lucrative on your part, getting the the junk? Yeah. And I say junk, yes. you know, but like, because you'd think that resellers would be going through scanning it all, you know? Well, I the people miss a lot, dude. Like I pull ten, fifteen, twenty dollar books out of out of the material that has been hit hard for three days, sometimes two sales. So they'll run a sale in the winter, another one in the summer, then it comes to me. I will still pull 10 and $15 books. The vast majority of the books that we're pulling out are really nice rank books that I'm going to make 3 and $4 on, which people avoid because they're charging a dollar and they say, okay, I don't want to pay a dollar to make four. I want to pay a dollar to make 10. So they put it right back. But you know, if you have a process in place where you can efficiently scan these, identify the profitable opportunities and list them, um, bulk list them into, into Amazon, it makes perfect sense to take a $3 book and sell it. Oh, absolutely. You, know, you can do it thousands of times over again. It, it really adds up. So that's, you know, having said that, that you know, there's pretty good money in it. I'm not so sure I want to put it in the bookstore because of the exposure that it's had. I don't know um, what I'm going to do there, but I, I definitely make money scanning. And the price is always right. You're solving a huge problem for these people. Most all of the right. time they, they pay people to get rid of it or their yards going to landfills. And I come along and, and do all the work for them. They love me. Um, I think I have two more questions for you. One is the name of your bookstore again. What was it? Dollar Book Shuffle. Dollar Book Shuffle. Okay. Um, and I had another question, which was around your certain radius, let's say 10 miles. How mm -hmm. many other used bookstores are there? Within 10 miles? I'm, I'm thinking of, I, it's not even a used bookstore. It's just a thrift store. There's nothing like me, I don't think, that I'm aware of. I mean, it's the first thing I did before before we um, sign up with the market is, is I look for for bookstores around me, there's one that's half the price of the, the, the cover, you know? So yeah. I'm a dollar bookstore. I wasn't worried about him and the rest are just thrift stores. And at most they're going to have three or 400 books on their shelves. They're not going to have, you know, 15, 20, 30,000 books available to the, to the general public for a dollar. Okay. You know, I got us, I've got one more, it's more of like a suggestion to you, but, uh, may, I think you might need want to get like a huge dinosaur head coming, like shooting out of your roof. <laughs> <laughs> like to where all the people like you know like a really big one to where people stop they take pictures and the kids are like wow the dinosaur bookstore I want to go there you know like just, just something to get their get attention. The kids in you get the parents in right you get the kids in they're like oh, I don't want ice cream I want books I want to go to that place and I want to fill a bag right like just are that you remember you ever seen South like Park that. where they do the inflatable arm guy you know what I'm talking about <laughs> no, no I don't I barely watch South Park I used to but I don't the big guy that does this I'm gonna get a few of them out there. <laughs> Yeah, get some stuff, man. Kids, kids really like dinosaurs, man. Just remember. So, just if you can get the kids in, the parents are going to be like, all right. And then that's the person that finds Fifty Shades of Grey, and you know, 
so on and so forth. But uh, just as my suggestion. Um, I think uh, this wraps up the show. Steve, got a little bit of housekeeping or anything like that? Sure, sure. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to talk about was July. Why don't you tell them about that, Chris? In, in, in July, we have the Green Room event going down. That's right. So we, right now we are feverishly working on the scheduling of the Green Room event, which is really, really fun. It's, uh, we're on our fourth installment of the Green Room meetup, which is going to happen in Austin, Texas, the preceding week of July 15th. So 15th is the main event, and then that entire week before is when people are going to be coming into town, having a lot of fun. We're going to do thrifting, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. It's just a whole lot of stuff. And the itinerary literally just got confirmed and built out yesterday. So um, we're going to be selling tickets to that pretty soon. And 100% like super affordable, nothing crazy. You do have to be a green room member to attend the main event. But a lot of that other stuff is still open to the public. So it's, you know, come come one, come all. If you're from Dallas, you're from Houston, San Antonio, hell, maybe from Austin, you're not in the green room. Come over, you know, come check it out, hang out with the green roomers and uh, see how it is. Um, but that's coming around. And we also have green room seminars on one of the days, which is going to be really interesting. Um, limited spots only. And that's basically what we've been working on for a very long time. We also have ASD right around the corner. So if you're going to ASD and you want to meet up with, you know, some people from the green room, uh, hit us up. Hit me or raking up behind the scenes on Facebook because ASD is like in a couple of weeks and we would like to meet up with you. You know, you don't have to be in yep. the green room to hang out with us. Like if you want to just get around us and meet us and, uh, you know, meet part of our other crew and other members, let's do it, you know? So let us know, shoot us a message on Facebook. But I think, uh, that's pretty much it. That's the you know brief housekeeping. And next next week though, I want to mention, we do have a green room member, uh, Mr. Finnamore, I believe that's how you pronounce his last name is going to be coming on talking about a business that he actually purchased a business from his profits that he made on Amazon FBA. So he purchased a business and um, I won't spoil the surprise right now, but it's pretty oh, cool. It's good. It's almost He's, Shark Tankish. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was just featured on TV. I guess the uh, his local TV channel they they found him and they they featured him. So that's gonna be a pretty cool show next week, Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern time. We are gonna start doing the shows an hour earlier. Um, so hopefully you guys can still watch. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, Jesse, thanks for coming on, man. It was hey, really thanks for having me. Man. We wish you the yeah, that was a best great, of luck. Great talk. Yeah, it was fun. We wish you the best of luck with the with the bookstore. And if there's anything else, you know, anything we can do to help, you know, we'll, we'll definitely, if you want us to, we'll link up your information down below to the bookstore. If if you feel like that's something that could possibly help. Um, cool. But yeah, man, thank you, yeah, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll keep you updated as as uh, I progress. I'm brand new at this, so I think it's gonna be good. Hey, you know. Everybody's brand new. I mean, I remember when I was brand new to, you know, selling bikes on Craigslist and brand new to eBay and FBA and, you know, now I'm brand new to, you know, doing Shopify. Um, you know, everybody's new, but you know, that's part of the game, right? You know, it's it's tough at first, right? Chris, I know you're you're getting ready to go on your you've already started your private label adventure, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's fun. I, I honestly like I, I look for I look for <clears throat> I could never just do the same thing over and over. Unless it's something that I absolutely control and own, and that's what's good about your good about your bookstore and your whole thing is, you actually care about books. You have a really crazy process down, and it's seeming to you know you got your avenues and you're creating your own avenue. You're literally creating an avenue, like that's your brand. avenue. That's pretty yeah, cool. It's yeah, it's your that's brand. Cool. It's your avenue, and no one's gonna tell you, you know, what to do with that. That's gonna be all you. So that's pretty interesting, and that's kind of how I'm doing with my business. That's what Rake, that's why Raken's messing with Shopify is. Sometimes you get kind of tired of fee increases and uh, you know other bigger companies kind of just throwing down the hammer at you you know that's not fun so you always got to look for opportunities and that's what we do at the green room we always look for opportunities and it's fun and like Rickon said we're new and being new is a great ex you know making failures and crazy decisions that's fun that's fun to yeah, us it's exciting for sure. it is exciting <laughs> hey, that's the way to live man you gotta you gotta fail you gotta fail because one of those failures you know, the right around the corner will be the most massive success of your life. So uh, you got to keep going. Right? Um, but thank you for being on our show. Ray, can I let you close it out? I think we're done, man. That's yeah, a great sure. Show. Yep. Thanks, Jesse. Chris, thanks thank for coming you, on. Uh, you guys like the video if you could. Big thumbs up. Leave a comment down below. Let us know how you enjoyed the video. Uh, download the free guide, 100 Amazing Items to resell down below. And I think that's about it. Thanks everybody. We'll see you next week for another green room show and peace out and go make that money. <laughs>